underpaid and overworked? Is a living wage and employee benefits like affordable health care more of a dream than a reality for you and your family? If so, it's time to form a union. Don't be denied the wages and benefits you deserve. Come together in a union with the power of numbers. A union is not a privilege, it's your right, and it will make a difference. Contact Teamsters Local 1932, a powerful and successful labor union in San Bernardino by visiting Teamsters1932.org backslash organize to start today. One of the best ways to build a healthier local economy is by shopping locally. Teamster Advantage is a shop local program started by Teamster Local 1932 that has brought together hundreds of locally owned businesses to provide discounts for residents who make shopping locally their priority. Everything from restaurants like Corky's to fun times at SB Raceway and much, much more. If you're not currently a Teamster and you want access to these local business discounts, contact Jennifer at 909-889-8377, extension 224. Give her a call. That number again is 909-889-8377, extension 224. Labor unions built the middle class, and the middle class built America. That's the message from Teamsters Local 1932, a strong and successful labor union based in San Bernardino that represents over 14,000 hardworking people across the Inland Empire. The Teamsters are ready to help you organize for better pay, increased benefits, and improved working conditions. Reach out to Teamsters 1932 at Teamsters1932.org backslash organize to speak with an organizer today. Here is the voice of the working class, Rick Smith. And welcome, brothers, sisters, working class heroes. This is the Rick Smith Show. Thanks so much for being here today on the big program. Lots to get to. Lots to talk about day one of no speaker vacation. Uh, evidently, the children in Congress left to their own vices have gone and spread in all kinds of mischief and mayhem. So what did they do? What did the children do today when they had no work? Kind of like a snow day, if you will, for Congress, um, you know, of their own making. You know, it's kind of like they pulled the fire alarm and you know, now they get the benefit of it. So what did they do with 13 months away from the 2024 election? What are they going to bring to the American people? Well, uh, <laughs> Uh, what did our bow tie wearing Wall Street puppet interim speaker Patrick McHenry do today? Well, he kicked Nancy Pelosi and Steny Hoyer out of their offices. <laughs> I, I, really? That's the that's the first that's the first club out of the bag. We're gonna go get Pelosi and Hoyer. We'll show them. And and, well, and this is just the beginning. Expect more. Expect more uh, musical offices. Because, look, they have no agenda. And understand, they did this on purpose. They did this on purpose so the story would be oh, they kicked Nancy Pelosi out of her office while she's in California at Dianne Feinstein's funeral. And, they, they, oh, look at that. That's the story. Not the fact that the, the, the house is on fire. Uh, the Republican Party has, has set the house on fire. And they have no way of putting this fire out. Now, what you hear is you're saying, you know, we should just calm down. You know, they're going to work through it. No, no, this is unprecedented. This is unprecedented. And it's who they are. So what did our, our children do? Uh, what did our, our reality stars and real nitwits of Washington, D.C. do today? Well, you had Marjorie Three Names and the rest of her kook caucus. They were doing the podcast circuit. <laughs> Spewing a bunch of nonsense. Heard a lot of, you know, this is the Democrats' fault. We're going, really? You're the majority. And I got to tell you, uh, the more I watch the, the Coop Caucus, the more I watch the Republicans do their thing, the more I realize that they don't really want to govern. They don't really want to be in power because they don't have an idea of what they're doing. They don't know what they're doing. These are people who want a, a, a beauty contest. They want a popularity contest. They have no idea. They barely found the bathroom, let alone know how to legislate, know how to compromise, know how to govern. No clue. They want a popularity contest. And it shows. And what it shows is they don't want to be in, in they don't want to be in the majority. 
They want to be the minority. They want to be the bomb throwers. They want to be the guy who stands up and says, no. But you didn't, we didn't ask you a question. No. I mean, that's all they want to do. They, they don't know anything else. And, and here's the thing. Um, we pay them. This is the brilliant part. Uh, we're paying them to do nothing. You know, we used to joke about the do-nothing Congresses of the past. Well, <laughs> they're doing something, literally burning the House down. And, you know, kicking Pelosi and Hoyer out of their offices. And look, this happens occasionally. This kind of tit-for-tat, I'll show you kind of, I'm in charge kind of thing. It happens. Don't care about it. Not even a little bit. What I care about is there's no agenda. None whatsoever. And I love the fact that uh, Patrick McHenry, the, the bow tie wearing interim speaker who's the puppet of Wall Street, uh, evidently not a chance he's going to be the speaker because uh, Representative Garrett Graves of Louisiana said, uh, hell no. I think there's, there's, uh, there's a scenario where Patrick McHenry could be this for extended period of time. Uh, hell no. <laughs> no, no. So he's not going to be the guy. So who is? We've heard the name Jim Jordan thrown around. In fact, I, I got to be honest, I don't know why Jordan would peek his head out. Because if he's actually a serious contender for the speakership, get ready to hear all about Jim. Not not J-I-M, G-Y-M. Get ready to hear about all of the, the exploits at Ohio State, all of the sex uh, scandal, all of the stuff that he covered up, all of the whining and crying and all the... The, the, trying to get people to turn on each other. Oh, oh, that will be the story. So I'm not sure why Jim Jordan's throwing his name other than he's just a power hungry uh, monger who was willing to step on anyone to get ahead. There's that. Uh, then Steve Scalise. I'm not sure why Scalise wants it. He's suffering. He's, he's, he's fighting blood cancer. I'm like, he could be dead not too long. How about, you know, I don't know, maybe maybe taking care of that. And then, well, <laughs> then the funny thing com comes in. Sean Hannity throws in, let Donald Trump be speaker. We want Donald Trump. And Marjorie Three Names goes on Alex Jones and says, yes, we want Donald Trump. He's the only one I'll vote for. And you go, I'm actually in favor of that. Please show the country that you have no idea how to govern, that you in a legislative body can't choose among you someone to lead you that you have to go outside of the institution entirely to get a reality tv star to come in and lead uh this this cavalcade of crazy and what's interesting is trump said he you know a lot of people have called me uh, about speaker all i can say is uh we will do whatever is best for the country and and other republican party and people not sure what that means uh but not ruling it out uh, again, no agenda, no idea. And what's interesting to me is the people that I talked to today, and I threw it out. I said, why do you think of Trump as secretary, as speaker? It, it was like someone won the Super Bowl. The people that I were talking to was like, oh, my God, that would be the greatest thing ever. They don't know what the speaker does or, you know, you know what Trump would do as speaker. They just want him because you know, they know it's going to tick off the libs. And as, as someone who I guess, I guess I'm fairly liberal, um, it doesn't tick me off at all. In fact, it would it would make me very happy if you did something really that stupid, that colossally, colossally stupid, because it would make the institution even less functional, if that's possible. If it is possible for the first time in history to have ousted a speaker uh, in the, like this, uh, if, if this isn't chaotic enough, not quite sure what is. Now, the other part of this is while they have no agenda, uh, they're, they're not going to have any money. Because one thing that McCarthy was, McCarthy's vindictive. You know, he's one of those guys, you know, he's kind of a weasel. Uh, but he was a, a money-raising machine. And now when you pull him out of that, who's going to fill the coffers? Uh, who's going to fill, you know, the campaign money? Because, you know, McCarthy's like, you're not going to me to kick around no more going to be interesting to see how this plays out and again I, I think the dems are doing the right thing just sit back uh pop some popcorn throw your feet up you know if, if your office isn't being taken away from you and just watch the reality show because truth be told nothing was going to get done anyway 
So show the American people how dysfunctional the Republican Party is and and let the chips fall where they may. Now, uh, Democrats, as I've always said, have this have this need almost. I don't know if it's a maternal need to save people, to take care of people. But Demo some Democrats, they feel the need to come in and save the day. Uh, and Democratic congressman from Minnesota, Dean Phillips, tweeted out. Um, and and uh, there's part of me that goes, I got two thoughts on this. One is he's trying to bail them out. And two is that you know maybe I agree with him. And here's what he tweeted. Uh, I care deeply about restoring faith in government, which is why I'll consider any speaker candidate of competency and integrity who's willing to place people in principle over politics, improve the institution of Congress, and lead America to bipartisan higher ground. Now, there's part of me going, well, you know, he's willing to, you know, he's willing to bail out the Republican Party. He's willing to save them from himself. Uh, that's what Democrats do. But, but then I read it a second time, and I'm going, okay, he'll consider a speaker uh, who's competent and has integrity. Well, <laughs> Um, that rules out three quarters of the Republican Party right there. Uh, principle over politics. I'm going to go with probably the rest of them. Um, improve the institution of a bunch of people who don't believe in the institution. Tell you that it, it, it shouldn't, it doesn't do anything. It shouldn't do anything. And then higher ground, a bipartisan higher. That's nobody. There's literally nobody to vote for uh, in the Republican uh, side of the aisle that fits any of those things. So there's part of me that goes, well, you know, it is what it is. This was a nice way of, of, of politicking a little bit, throwing it out there, saying, of course I'd be willing to help if there was this, this mythical, if there was a unicorn out there that could possibly do, you know, the things that, that I've, I've laid out. And in that vein, I, I, I'm not, I'm not going to beat him up. Now, the fact that he, he left Democratic leadership over Biden, you know, seeking re-election, that's just plain, I don't, I don't get but it is what it is. Now, what we do know is while the train wreck is going on in the House and the children are running amok, uh, James Comer, he is the House Oversight Chair, uh, he says they're, uh, they're going to stick with their impeachment inquiry of Biden. Uh, he says you know, he believes the committee could, could legally continue its work without having a, an actual speaker. He thinks they can. And this is one of those things where you go, you think you can? Again, that's right, we're in un uncharted waters. Never happened before. Now, again, as I said a moment ago, the reality is Republicans are going to continue to tell us that government is broken. It's broken. We need to tear everything down. We need to start over. We need to, we need to reinvent the widget. And the reality is government is not broken. Government works just fine. It's the Republican Party that's broken. They're broken. They're the ones who have broken this. Once you take them out of the equation, once you put them back into their, their much cherished, much sought after minority role, things work pretty well. Because if you remember, Nancy Pelosi had a much slimmer margin than McCarthy had. And yet somehow, somehow, she became speaker, didn't, didn't agree to a whole bunch of insanity, and actually got stuff done. Shock of shock. Now, understand, and I get this, that the Republicans have some, some, luna, some lunacy problems uh, that maybe the Democrats don't. But look, the Dems have some far out folks on their side, too. Uh, it's, it's, called, it's called keeping your people in, in, in together and not agreeing to stupidity. So we're going to see what happens and where this takes us. But I got a lot to get to, a lot to talk about. I want to hear your thoughts. Email me, rick at the ricksmithshow.com. Going to take a quick break right back after this. Stick around. You're listening to The Rick Smith Show. For working people. The best.
We are AFGE, the American Federation of Government Employees. We represent 700,000 federal and D.C. government workers who are the vital threads of the fabric of American life. We support our nation's military. We take care of our nation's veterans. We protect our nation's borders. We respond to our nation's crises and natural disasters. We provide services to our nation's seniors. The American Federation of Government Employees. We work for America. The phone lines are open. Give Rick a call at 1-866-416-RICK. That's 1-866-416-7425. Welcome back to the Rick Smith Show. Now, here is Rick Smith. So the big story today, 75,000 workers hit the picket line today, Healthcare workers across the country. And, and look, uh, this was this was this was coming. We knew it was coming uh, because I look at the fact that Kaiser Permanente reported in the first two quarters uh, four and a half billion dollars in profit. Four and a half billion dollars. Their CEO pocketed fifteen point six billion or million. But here you've got workers who are working for pretty close to poverty wages. And this is, again, another one of those moments of working people who have just had enough. Uh, So in Virginia and Washington, D.C., you had workers walking off the job at six o'clock this morning. They're going to go on strike, uh, I guess, for for one day uh, in California, uh, Colorado, Washington, Oregon. They went on strike at nine o'clock this morning. I believe they're going to be out for three days, if I'm not mistaken. But you've got this coalition of unions that represent some eighty five thousand workers for at Kaiser Permanente. And they're saying, look, we've got major staffing shortages. Those major staffing shortages are leading to potential unsafe conditions. You know, someone, you know, emailed me the other day and said, you know, the number three cause of death in this country is medical errors. And I'm like, I I, no, I I haven't checked that, but someone sent that to me and I'm going, I I don't know that to not be true based on the fact that we have a system that is set up where profit is sacrosanct. Well, we're squeezing the quarter till the eagle screams and, you know, working conditions be damned, staffing levels be damned. And look, you know, we, you end up having longer wait times. There's massive patient uh, neglect. Uh, there's all kinds of stuff that that we should be that we should be focusing on. And that's what this is about. Yeah, it's about the wages. It's about the benefits, but it's about the conditions. It's about the fact that that these these nurses and these these workers are going, hey, we need the resources. We need the staffing levels. We need the the ability to take care of people and do our job. Uh, they're also fighting to say, hey, look, you know, we want to make sure that our work doesn't get outsourced and subcontracted and sliced and diced and, and given away. We want to have ownership of our work so that we have control of those circumstances. Because what happens is they bring in contract people who, well, you know, they can get rid of them anytime they want. Those workers don't have any voice, any say. So what these what these healthcare workers are saying, look, we want to have some we want to have some skin in, in how our patients are cared for. And I've got to tell you, that's that's important. I I say this all the time. Uh, nurses are the, the greatest people in the world with hands down, without question. Uh, I, you know, I listen to the doctor sometimes. But when a doctor says something, I then go to the nurse and I go, you know, what is he is what he said? Right. Because they seem to know <laughs> they seem to know more because they deal with people. They seem to understand things. So I'm hoping they reach an agreement. They've been bargaining since April. The contract expired on September 30th, and they said, hey, look, at some point we got to pull the trigger. Uh, so you're going to see a, a day-long strike uh, for uh, you know the, the workers in the, the mid-Atlantic and then on the West Coast. I guess it's going to be a three-day three strike. And the hope is, look, the hope is that this is the, the, the shock to the system that makes the uh, the, em- the employer Kaiser Permanente a nonprofit with four and a half billion dollars profit in the first two quarters of this year, uh, say hey you know maybe maybe we do need to do some things to to make care better, to make working conditions better, to make pay and benefit better. Also, one of the things they're also talking about is retiree health care. This is another one of these things that I'm glad to see back. Uh, we had we had fought for it for a while, couple of, couple of generations ago. Something I think needs to be fought for again. 
because I don't know that we're ever getting the national health care. But maybe this is how we get there to ensure that cradle to grave people are taken care of. Uh, but just my thoughts. Let's go to the phones. We've got Alice on line one. Alice, how are you? Totally insane. So I was talking to a uh, MAGA Republican today, and they brought up to me about <laughs> – it was a neighbor. Um, so they brought up to me that, um, you know, about McCarthy being removed. And I thought, oh, joy, here we go. And I said, well, you know, I said, there's some crazy lunatics that you've got in the Republican Party. And unfortunately, that uh, minority there is causing you all kind of problems. And they, were, they, they actually agreed with me, and I thought I was going to faint. And uh, then they said, well, I'll tell you one thing. At least you Democrats aren't arguing with each other. And I just hurry up and change the subject. But I thought, oh, wow, some of the MAGA Republicans are taking note now. There's common ground. But I think they, yeah. So um, I also seen in uh, the Washington Post where they were saying Matt Gates <laughs> wants to be Speaker of the House. And I, I thought I was going to... Um, um, fall on the floor from laughing so hard. Yeah, well, we'll see. I thought, oh yeah, let's let's get him in there. I'm right? all in favor of it. No, let's bring it. Bring on the crazy. <laughs> bring Trump. Maybe you can have a co thing. Maybe tr Gates and and Trump. Yeah, maybe maybe co co speakers. Because uh, look, they're not going to well, get anything done. They don't have an agenda. They don't have policy initiatives that are are passable. Uh, they've they've got they've got hardline insanity that can't that is never going to pass. Uh, they've got messaging right, well, bills that are all about cruelty and and hatred, and and and, and it, they're they're getting exactly what they deserve. Well, that's true, but I think they do have an agenda, Rick. And the agenda that they have is to cause as much chaos and destruction and misery as they can. Yeah, well, I think that is their agenda. Mission accomplished. <laughs> exactly. But have a good evening. Thanks, Alice. Appreciate it. No, I, that. I truly, I'm, I'm coming around to the reality that, that Republicans don't want to be in the majority, at least the House Republicans. Uh, because look, you know, I've, I've known a lot of people who've, who've been in Congress. And to do it right, to actually do the job, it's, it's a lot of work. And it's not glamorous. It's not, you know, it's, it's, it's not all, you know, TV interviews and, and, and pats on the back and ribbon cuttings. It's a lot of, it's a lot of, it's a lot of research. It's a lot of reading. A lot of reading. These bills are not short. And I know you have the, the Herman Cain's of the world. You know, every piece of legislation I pass is going to be two pages long so that you can read it at the dinner table. You go, yeah, you're going to two pages, huh? You think you're going to be able to do, you know, I'm going to do health care reform in two pages. Yeah. Again, shows how little they understand on, on what it takes to govern. This is one of those places where I want smart people want smart people who are going to do good things and want to do good things this is the part that's that's just remarkable to me you have you know you can go through the list of of the republicans who are usually on the podcast circuit or on the f channel or any of the other right-wing cable outlets it's all about hey look at me it's all about how can i get that next gig it's not about making your life better it's not about making the lives of working people better and this is where, and I've said this before, this is my true north. How do we make the person who gets up every day, punches that clock, does, does what's asked of them, how do we make their lives better? How do we get more, more money into their paychecks? How do we get better health and retirement security into their lives, better education for their children? How do we do, you know, go down the list, a better infrastructure to, so it doesn't take them so long to get to work, you know, maybe public trade. There, there are a thousand things we could be doing, but we're not. You know what we're doing? We're throwing Nancy Pelosi out of her office. Because <laughs> that's, that's the best they could come up with. That's it. I mean, wow. I mean, if, if you really wanted to play the reality TV game, couldn't you come up with something more creative? And the answer is no, because it's not about that. It's about dysfunction. And I hope the American people in 13 months go to the polls 
and throw these people into the minority. I'd love to see all of them go because they're not serious legislators. These are not serious people who care about the American people. They're not. These are, peop these are chaos merchants. These are outrage merchants. But Rick, it's not all of them. You know, I used to believe you're right. It, it's not all of them. But the fact that there doesn't seem to be any room for movement, the fact that they have no ideas and no, no, no will to make lives better, I, I, I'm just not there anymore. They've lost me on that. You know, it's not all of them. You're now guilty by association. As, as my mother always said, you're judged by the friends you hang out with. You know, those bums you hang out with that were causing trouble, well, you're one of them. Well, you, you got that R behind your name, you're one of them. Want to hear your thoughts? Email me, rick at the ricksmithshow.com. Quick break, right back after this. Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1936. That was the day Londoners referred to as the Battle of Cable Street. By some accounts, as many as 250,000 trade unionists, radicals, and anti-fascist fighters joined together to protest Sir Oswald Mosley's British Union of Fascists. The fascists planned to march in black shirt uniform through London's then heavily Irish and Jewish working class East End neighborhood. Mosley's BUF scapegoated Jews for the economic crisis brought on by the Great Depression. He had drawn thousands to rallies in previous years and now looked to impose fascist dominance over the most vulnerable of Londoners. Bill Fishman, a Jewish activist and son of an immigrant tailor who was there on that day, recollected, quote, I was moved to see the bearded Jews and Irish Catholic dockers standing up to stop Mosley. I shall never forget that as long as I live how working class people could get together to oppose the evil of fascism. The Metropolitan Police stationed as many as 10,000 policemen to keep counter protesters from directly confronting the BUF. But the anti-fascist physically blocked every possible path into the East End. They constructed barricades along Cable Street made from paving stones and household furniture. Women emptied garbage bags and chamber pots from windows onto the fascists. Marbles were thrown in the direction of the fascists and their protectors. Seamen pulled out their lorries and turned them on their sides. Tram drivers parked and abandoned their streetcars in the middle of the street to prevent the fascists from continuing their march. Protesters chanted the slogan of the Spanish Civil War, No Passeran, or They Shall Not Pass. And that day, the fascists did not pass. They were stopped by the power of working people. In the mid-1800s, a new political party flared up in America, posing as an alternative to both the Democratic and Republican parties. Xenophobic and nativist, it was extremely secretive about its specific structure, motive, and agenda. Indeed, members were instructed to say, I know nothing, when asked about details. Thus, it was quickly dubbed the Know Nothing Party. In 1856, it nominated Millard Fillmore as its presidential nominee, but he was reticent to talk about the party and even unwilling to proclaim that he was a member. He lost, and the Know Nothing soon withered. But now, here comes another alternative party with secretive motives and backers. Labeling themselves No Labels, this group ought to be named the Nothing Party, for it offers nothing of substance to voters. Its so-called common-sense agenda is fluffier than cotton candy, yet it's trying to run a third-party candidate in next year's presidential race. Why? Follow the money. That's not easy to do, though, for this gaggle of conservative corporatists slyly incorporated as a nonprofit social welfare outfit, a deceit that lets it hide the names of its political funders from the public. The New Republic, however, got records revealing that no labels is a fat cat front with Texas billionaire Republican Harlan Crow leading the way. Who? Crow is the political patron who has secretly been lavishing luxury gifts and cash on Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas, who in turn has embraced Crow's plutocratic positions in court cases. 
This is Jim Hightower saying that same plutocratic agenda appears to be fueling no labels third party presidential push. For these rich politicos know that a milk toast spoiler candidate would most likely draw independent moderates from Joe Biden, giving Crow and company another GOP corporate presidency. It's a cynical game, but that's how they play it. Welcome back to the Rick Smith Show. Now, here is Rick Smith. So, the tweet of the day comes from Rick Wilson. Uh, the Rick Wilson said, Stop asking if 1930s Germany can happen here. It's happening here. And look, he's absolutely right. I and mean, it's been happening for a while. Not surprising. And, and I, blame, I blame our media. I've been, I've been saying this for a long time. I know it's easy. It's easy. It's cheap shot. But I blame our corporate controlled media for you know doing this whole both sides thing as I'm uh, always being well, you know, we've got to we've got to tell the other side. For instance, Washington Post, we talked about this yesterday, uh, still reporting that the fraud trial uh, still reporting that that it's alleged. No, the judge said he's guilty of fraud. That's the reality. There was a summary judgment. The bench trial, it happened. It's no longer alleged. Stop. Anyway, here to share some thoughts on the both sidesism. And are we? Are we? Are we living? Is it happening? Is 1930s G- Germany happening right before our very eyes? That's why I've asked my good friend Will Bunch to come talk with us. Will is a national columnist over at the Philadelphia Inquirer. He's also the author of the fabulous book After the Ivory Tower Falls. How college broke the American dream and blew up our politics, and how to fix it. Well, thanks for taking time for us. Hey, Rick. Hey, thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. So this this frame people have been talking about for a little bit about this both sides is you you know you've got you know, you know the Republicans saying you know one thing, you got Democrats saying another. One side's telling something close to reality. One just kind of making stuff up, not even close to reality, but yet got to report them as they're equal. Yeah, I mean, we, you know, you know, we saw a crazy example of that just in the last couple of days with uh, this total meltdown that's happening up on Capitol Hill, right? And um, you know, you you get these mainstream papers like the Washington Post and the, and the New York Times writing pieces that basically say, you know, why is Congress so dysfunctional, or you know, why can't Congress uh, pass a budget bill, or uh, you know, uh, uh, McCarthy gets ousted, and it's like. Congress is totally broken. It's like, no, I mean, Congress isn't broken. I mean, the Democrats in Congress seem to be doing just fine. It's a, uh, it's it's one party that that's totally broken. Yep. And and you know, all these things that we're talking about, they're also interrelated. You know, uh, uh, um, you know, this this dysfunctional Congress, which is totally the the fault of Republicans. Um, but that's that's one of the things that's enabling this brand of fascism that we're seeing now because they, they want to gin up citizen cynicism, right? They want voters to think the system is so badly broken that, you know, that only a strong man can fix it. Yeah. That, uh, you know, democ- look, look, democracy, you know, this is what they say that look, democracy is not working anymore. So we, we need to try something else. And, no, but and, Will, I've been saying for years, Republicans run on, on government shouldn't do anything, can't do anything, government's broken. And then when they get in there, they set out to break it. Now they've just completely broken it. They, I think they've gone a bit too far in breaking things. Where <laughs> I'm hoping, and maybe you'll agree or disagree, I'm hoping the American people are paying attention because we are absolutely in uncharted waters right now. Uh, this has not happened before in our country, and a lot of firsts seem to be happening with Republican leadership right now. And I'm hoping voters are paying attention because we're 13 months away from the the, the next election. Yeah, you know, um, uh, I'm actually working on a column right now. It's not going to be published until tomorrow, unfortunately. But uh, it, it really touches on a lot of the things that we're talking about here. And uh, this is fascinating. And, and so far, only The Guardian, which not enough Americans probably read, it's a very good publication, uh, but o- only the Guardi- Guardian has done a story about this. But you know th- these these far right think tanks. I know that's kind of an oxymoron to t- talk about the far right and, and thinking, right? But uh, you know the, these these groups like the Claremont Institute uh, and 
Hillsdale, Hillsdale College, which are, you know, these, these groups um, uh, that have been created to, to come up with this kind of pseudo intellectual heft behind, you know, Trumpism and, and the authoritarian drift of the Republican Party. They, they, in the last like six months or so, you know, these, these pseudo intellectuals on the right have been writing pieces saying that, that we, America needs what they call a red Caesar, I guess, red being for Republican, right? Uh, a Caesar, you know, that uh, like in ancient Rome, you know, are to argue that democracy is not working and we need somebody to come in and assume dic dictatorial powers, you know, and it's like, Oh, just, you know, just temporarily, just to, you know, just to get the, uh, just to get the uh, uh, Marxists or whatever they're calling people these days uh, out of the deep state, you know, just, just to, just to break down the uh, influence of, of all these liberals who've taken over these agencies and, and these systems, you know, and that's, that's their plan, you yeah. know, I mean, they, they have this blueprint called Project 2025. I don't know if you guys have talked about yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, Heritage Foundation. On this show. Yeah, yeah, and um, uh, you know, it's basically to, you know, end end civil service. Um, uh, it's you to, know, to bring back patronage but, is what it is. Yeah, yeah, and put put Trumpists in every, you know, over EPA and and uh, NLRB and any other important agency that you can think of. It, 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 but 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 destroy them. You know, it's one thing. You know, this isn't Ronald Reagan putting, uh, you know, and you know, Gorsuch's mom in, in the EPA and, and and siding with polluters. This this is destroying the EPA. This is like breaking these agencies beyond recognition. But here's and, the thing, and, and, and we've talked yeah. about this, you know, over over the last several years. Um, you know, uh, right now we're, Alec is celebrating its 50th anniversary. None of this stuff is new. Uh, the Heritage Foundation is over 50 years old. They created this massive uh, state policy network of, of think tanks or, you know, stink tanks or whatever you want to call them. In every state, they've got uh, chaos merchants coming up with their own alternative reality, their own alternative facts. And as, as I've been saying here, Republicans right now are lying differently. They're lying much differently than past generations because they're creating their own reality out of these groups that you're talking about. All these state policy networks, all of the folks that you talked about, they're creating out of whole cloth. They're just pulling stuff out of, you know, out of whichever orifice they can grab it out of. And, and that now becomes the talking point. Whereas in the past, at least there were decent, honest people on that side of the aisle who said, no, that's too far. Now it seems like they're all on board. Yeah, I mean... You know, Mitt, Mitt Romney, who was the last, of, arguably, of one of those type people, is you know, it's like he's had enough. I mean, the last, last few people who maybe, you know, I mean, J John McCain is long gone, and 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 I wasn't, I'm not huge fans of those of those people and their politics, but at least you're right. At least there was a level of honesty. You know, you know, I think it's interesting. I was thinking when you were saying about how a lot of a lot of these practices have been going on for some time, and it's just. Like it seems like it's getting worse. I mean, you know, I, I think what I think you're right. And I think what's happened, though, is I think that, you know, starting, you know, going back to the 60s, you know, when the when the culture wars really kicked off and and and, and also, you know, when you had the Voting Rights Act and the yeah. Civil Rights Act and you had, uh, you know, you had Title IX empowering women. Right. You, you know, you had all, all of these things. And, um, you know, the, the initial reaction is. We can beat this through politics, right? You know, they, you know, they had Ronald Reagan, who was a master politician, and you know, and and they were able to to win elections. You know, they won the '88 election with the Willie Horton ad and these other scare tactics against black people, and um, it was ugly and it was it was horrible, but um, but they could win elections. And as you know, I mean, since 1988, uh, you know, Republicans have lost the popular vote in seven out of the eight seven out of the last eight presidential elections um because you know, their policies are bad this is this is important their policies yeah. are horrible the american people realize that their pro-corporate pro-rich people you know anti-worker sure. agenda is horrible for the mass of the people so yes they're going to lose the popular vote which is why they've had to go full on uh you know you know alternative yeah. reality alternative fact fear scare and and and, and shame people yeah 
I mean, I mean, what this movement is, what 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 conservatism in this country is all about is preserving the hierarchies, right? Preserving the hierarchy of, you know, white supremacy or white privilege or whatever you want to call it. You know, preserving the patriarchy. You know, where where men are dominant, uh, and they're going to do that to to borrow a phrase of Malcolm X. They're going to do that by any means necessary, right? And um, if, if elections can't do it, they're going to find some other way. And, you know, I mean, I mean, they went from, you know, winning, winning elections with, uh, you know, Willie Horton type ads to, you know, voter suppression, voter ID laws, thing, things to suppress the vote. And, and now even that's not enough. So that's why, you know, you, you see if we can somehow get, you know, if we can somehow get Trump in there in, in 2025, we're just going to throw it all out. We're just going to make him become a red Caesar, you know, have him seize, you know, they, they won't call it dictatorial powers. I don't know what they're going to call it, but that's what it's going to be. It's going to be dictatorial powers. And, but, and, you know, and just real quickly, I mean, this is why what we were initially talking about, what you were initially talking about, the, the both sides problem in the media, this is why that is so important because um, that, that, that reality is not coming across to the average voter, I don't think. No, because it's coming across to some people. I mean, there's more, you know, like that Rick Wilson tweet that you quoted at the beginning. Um, yeah, I mean, you're hearing more discourse like that, right? You're you're hearing more people saying, "No, this is really like 1930s fascism was in in Europe." You know, well, what, what I was going to say is, you know, you have this this want of authoritarianism by by folks on the right. Uh, you know, I look at I look at that story coming out of Staten Island of of all those people in Staten Island, you know, you know, doing all kinds of outrageous stuff to people who are who have been uh, moved there from Texas or Florida or wherever, you know, you know, playing music at all hours of the night, uh, harassing the the, uh, the the refugees and all of this stuff, just just being horrible human beings. It's it, it's, hor it's horrible. You know, you know, I, I've I've just noticed, uh, I've just seen really recently, like in the last few months, just. A huge uptick in this type of behavior and l let me give you another example you know we had um uh we had a guy who was a freelance journalist and kind of an activist here in philadelphia a guy named josh kruger uh uh who was formerly homeless uh for, you know overcame drug addiction and he wrote he wrote about these issues and, and he was a real kind of civic mensch civic asset and um you know he was murdered this week and you know, a lot of us who knew him, I mean, I knew him on social media mainly, but those of us who knew him, you know, posted, you know, uh, were shocked, what a loss. And these posts on social media were flooded with haters saying, good riddance, you know, one less journalist, thank God this guy was killed. Uh, and that, that happened, apparently a, a liberal activist was murdered in a street crime up in New York City a few days ago. And the same thing happened where you've got these like swarms of, online online fascists basically you you know and i don't maybe some of them are coming from russia or somewhere else maybe they're, they're not even all americans but um you know and and the staten island thing i was just reading about that today it's it's another side of that same coin it's just this ugliness out there and no, I, see i've been saying for a while social media has allowed people to be the worst versions of themselves and I think Trump and the Republican Party have, have you know, because online is one thing, but out in public is another and dealing with each other is another. And I think Trump uh, and the Republican Party have given people the uh, I'm not, I'm not going to say the permission, but have, have allowed the idea that you can be the worst version of yourself, not just online, but to people's face. And this is where I fear that this this hype, this tension is going to continue to rise to a point where possibly there may be violence at some point down the road. Yeah. Well, remember, remember when Trump first came on the scene when he ran the first time in 2015 and 2016 and, and all those people at his rallies saying, you know, I love this guy. He tells it like it is. And it's like, well, no, he was he was just he was just saying the racism and, and, and xenophobia and other things that they wanted to say. Yeah. And, and he was saying it. And at some point, it's like. Yeah, if he's saying it, then then we can say it too, you know. And I think you, you've seen this devolve, you know, over over the last eight years. And um, yeah, I mean, uh, I look at Twitter. Twitter's become a cesspool. And yeah, you, and, you know, and, and and Elon Musk, the owner, 
for whatever reason is is enabling this. And no, I think he bought. I said this from the. I said the day he bought it, uh, he he has bought Twitter to destroy it, and 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 look, there was just an article out the other day that has proved me right. He, you know, he's going from the playbook that was given to him when he bought Twitter to to destroy it because uh, you can't have a platform where people actually get news and information and i'm sure you saw today that they're they're ending the uh the headlines on articles that are being shared because i guess you, they don't ever want you to leave uh that 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 cesspool of a of a platform yeah which you know takes away one of the original things that people really liked about twitter back in the pre-elon musk era which was you know going on there to find out what was going on people would post links to articles that you hadn't seen and you know, it it still works sometime. That whole that whole Red Caesar thing in the Guardian, I wouldn't have seen that if somebody yeah. hadn't linked to it on Twitter, right? So, but you know, you know, they're trying to take that away, and, and it is it is amazing, and and it's like, you know, I mean, is is it is it really that simple that it's just that Elon Musk is is this billionaire who doesn't want to get taxed, doesn't want uh doesn't want a government that is anti billionaire, anti wealth. And, you know, and he's willing to, you know, I, he realized that Twitter was a threat to that, right? You know, if if Twitter operated the way it could operate. Yeah. Last know. question I've got for you, uh, yeah. because you know we're in this we're in this situation. Uh, the media, I think, was a big part of getting us here. Uh, this whole both sides ism thing, uh, and and I, I love the one the one statement I saw. You know, you know, should the media give uh, equal weight to both sides, even when one of them is lying? And the fact that someone would even ask that question is is just incredible to me. But that's kind of the world we're in. So if they got us into this, do you have any hope that they get us out? I don't know. You know, the people the people who are running the big organizations, you know, the I mean the the, the New York Times and the Washington Post, which are so influential, both have fairly recent new editors and they both you know, and and, and I the Wall Street Journal, I believe, also, which I think it was the editor of the Wall Street Journal who made that comment that you were just quoting. And, you know, the, the, these people are all new and they are all wedded to this, to the both sides philosophy. And, you know, I, I, I've been in journalism for, um, I, I lost track, well over 40 years, 42 or 43 years now. And and, and so, so I know the mentality and I understand and I understand where it comes from. And it was, it was born in a different era and you know when i when i was a young journalist uh i, I bought into it i applauded it and then i i saw things that actually happened in the real world like the uh you know the, the bogus iraq war in 2003 for example and, and and i came to realize that you know the flaws of both sides journalism that it doesn't work and 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 the situation we're in now is you know a, a five alarm situation because you know journalism and democracy are just intertwined you know you, you can't be a, you can't be a journalist and be neutral about about democracy because you know we see around the world in in the the more established dictatorships you know we see what happens to journalists you know we see look at what yeah, happens they throw to them journalists out of planes. yeah look look at look at vladimir putin's russia where you know journalists if they're not banned they're being tossed out of windows right you know and um uh, see, see, so you can't be neutral about that, and I, I don't think the public is getting enough information about about the um, anti-democratic threat that we're facing right now. I'm right there with you. I don't. Uh, Will, I appreciate the time as always. Great stuff. Keep up the great work. I hope folks will check out uh, the book, also the uh, the, the column. Uh, we'll get links out on social media how folks can do that. But Will, I appreciate the time. Yeah, Rick, thanks for having me. I appreciate it as well. Good to talk to you. Good stuff. Our good friend, Will Bunch. I want to hear your thoughts. Email me, rick at the ricksmithshow.com. Let's we'll take a quick break. Right back after this, stick around. You're listening to the Rick Smith Show. We're working people. Let's we'll talk. Phone lines are open. Give Rick a call at 1 866 416 Rick. That's 1 866 416 7425. 
I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1918. That was the evening that a series of explosions began at the T.A. Gillespie Company near Morgan, New Jersey. The explosions would destroy the plant and 300 buildings and kill an estimated 100 people. The world was embroiled in World War I. The United States had entered the global conflict the year before. The nation's factories were churning out munitions and other supplies for the war effort. On that fateful evening at Gillespie, workers were loading shells at the sprawling complex of 700 buildings that covered more than 2,000 acres. The initial explosion was likely an accident. Regardless, the explosion was so severe that it cut water lines to that part of the plant. Without water pressure, firefighters struggled to douse the flames. A chain reaction of explosions touched off as the fire spread in the plant. Houses in the nearby town shook from the massive explosion. Windows exploded and residents fled. Residents from three towns were evacuated due to the disaster. The New York Sun described the exodus as, quote, streams of human misery, mothers and fathers, frightened children clutching still more frightened dogs, old, old people tottering along with all the same dazed expressions on their faces, as if they scarcely realized what had happened. When the fire was finally put out, nearly half of the plant's buildings were destroyed. It was impossible to say exactly how many workers were killed, so bad was the carnage. Two members of the U.S. Coast Guard died responding to the disaster. The disaster was then compounded when a flu epidemic swept through the residents evacuated from nearby towns. The death toll and misery from these tragic events mounted even higher. Labor History in Two brought to you by the Illinois Labor History Society and the Rick Smith Show. You're listening to the Rick Smith Show, where working people come to talk. Again, I go back to the frame. Republicans lie differently today. You know, back in the old days, it was at least a kernel of truth. Now, well, they're just, as Kellyanne Conway said, they've got their alternative facts. And you know which orifice they pulled those out of. Let's go to the phone lines. We got Steve on line one from Chicago. Steve, how are you? Yes, I'm fine. And uh, I wanted I wanted to chime in on the, the discussion you were having with the uh, with the previous guest. I caught the tail end of that. And uh, when it comes to looking at the scholarship on uh, why societies uh, disintegrate, we actually find that it's because of distrust in the courts, distrust, distrust in terms of lawmakers, distrust in terms of journalism, all, all of the institutions that you rely upon in a democracy, a functional democracy, when those cease to function, a society can disintegrate. And that's why it's essential that, that we have these, these institutions and that they are functional. And unfortunately, uh, trust, when you ask Americans, it's at record lows when it comes to media. It's at record lows when it comes to uh, the, the legislature and also the presidency. Now, obviously, Donald Trump contributed to that with regard to the executive office. Uh, lo- low trust in terms of uh, the, the House and the Senate. Well, that's been something that's been going on for a couple of decades. But now we introduce a dangerous third element, and that is the extremely low trust that exists in the highest court in the land. Because there was a time in America when, when pretty much we could rely on the high court to be an objective arbiter of what goes on in our democracy. Uh, but no longer. Now it's the feeling among many Americans is that basically it's, it's just another, uh, another element in, in the, the lawmaking process that can be bought and sold by the wealthy. And, and, and that's a problem. Again, if we want the, this society uh, to survive in terms of its, its function as a, demo, as a constitutional republic, those institutions need to be maintained and strengthened. And this, this idea that they can, we can just simply sit by and watch as they deteriorate without any of the impact is, ju- is just naive. Yeah. What, do you, what do you make of the argument that, that Will was making about you know, that the right is you know, possibly going to be pushing for uh, a red Caesar, or, you know, an authoritarian to come in and say, I, I can fix uh, a Donald Trump. Say, I alone, I can fix all of those problems because you're right. Congress is, you know, I think syphilis was more at a higher approval rating than Congress. Uh, you know, and you know, as you said, the, the, you know, the, the Supreme Court struggling, the executive branch is struggling, you know, all of this stuff. You know, what do you make of that? Do you, do you think that's something Americans would tolerate? Well, you know, uh, like a lot of people, I thought, uh, you know, with the Cold War having come to an end, 
the, you know, the, the book, The End of History, you know, uh, basically articulated with a lot of those thoughts. You know, okay, the, the last great conflict has been resolved, uh, and that liberal Western democracy was the order of the day moving forward. And this idea of, you know, a, a strong man rule and the desire to see someone like a Stalin or a Hitler or other s- sorts of figures such as this, that, w- that was something that we had outgrown. Well, you know, the, the human beings are now more sophisticated. Now it turns out that we're not. There are some of us that are, but there are other people who just want to be led by the nose and are willing to listen to who, whomever tells them what they want to hear. And that's what Donald Trump did in 2016. He, he basically told a bunch of people who didn't know any better that, yeah, I'll, I'll get you back your grandfather's coal mining job, as if somebody actually wanted that or that was possible. Hillary Clinton refused to tell the lie but Donald Trump decided to lie to people as if that was that, that was something that could happen, given the fact that those jobs are not overseas, as he claimed. They're taken over uh, by automation, right. you know, and so they're not coming back. And, and when people don't care about sex, they just care about the savior. So in the same way that Adolf Hitler promised to save Germany, Donald Trump has, uh, took it from his playbook and other fascist playbooks. Yep. You know, nope. uh, You're spot on, Steve. Who are the, yeah, I mean, these are the people who are to blame. They don't look like you. They have different religions. Their complexion is different. And, and I agree. Uh, let me save us. Got to go. Steve, appreciate the thoughts. Quick Thank break. You. Right back. Stick around. This is the third time since I was sworn in two years ago I've had a once-in-a-century storm. New York City floods again. From Minneapolis to Mexico, bizarre extreme heat waves set new September records. Plus... All it takes is one big event in a high concentrated area and you will see uh, financial collapse. Home insurance bubble could burst as climate disasters strain insurance markets. Oh great. All of those stories and more straight ahead from bradblog.com. I'm Brad Friedman. And I'm Desi Doyan. Stand by for six minutes of independent green news, politics, analysis, and snarky comment. In the next 10 years with the right policies and an an experienced leadership in the White House, we can reclaim our role as the leading energy producer on Earth. Oh, you mean like we already are, Mike Pence? Thanks, Joe Biden. KCAA Loma Linda. 